So glad to be worshiping with you still, church. Let's keep singing to the Lord, proclaiming his name. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come
Good morning, and welcome to the DFW Church of Christ. We are so excited to have you joining us in worship today. My name is Tyler Brock, this is Peyton Donato, and we have the honor and privilege of being a part of the South Worship Center. If you're visiting our church, thank you for joining us. We hope this time is inspiring to you as we worship God together. Let's take a moment for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful and so honored just for the opportunity that you've given us just to come together yet another Sunday and worship you, God. God, we pray that this time is fruitful. We pray that this time is powerful, God. And we pray that the message that people hear today can be inspired and they walk away with something that applies to their lives. God, I thank you for all your grace and your mercy that you show us on a daily basis. And we pray that you just continue to bless us in our church. It's in your son Jesus' name and I pray. Amen. Amen. Now join us in singing another song. Yours is the 
together today. We hope you are enjoying our service so far. Our speaker this morning is Derek Vett. The title of his message is All Authority. Before we hear from Derek, let's enjoy one more song. Come on now church, get up on your feet. You cannot sing this song sitting down. So stand on up, clap your hands. We know that God reigns in our lives, so we're going to sing about it this morning. Let's go, y'all. Ladies. Our God Come on. is an awesome God. He reigns Come on. from heaven above with me. Some power and love our God is an awesome God. Come on. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with me. Some power and love our God is an awesome Let's God. Let's sing. Come on. You're marvelous and you're glorious. Your love is me victorious. You took the way the fear in us. Now we praise you cause you can deliver us. Ladies, there ain't no stopping us. No. Devil, there ain't no blocking us. No. Come, Come on, on and clap your hands with us. I like this, y'all. Like that, y'all. Good morning, everyone. I hope we have really been inspired by the example and ministry of Jesus as we've all been studying through the Gospels this summer. I know some of us are reading the Gospels in different orders, but we are all reading all four of the Gospels. For the message this morning, I want to focus on something I was impacted by from the Gospel of Matthew. I shared a version of this earlier in our Northeast Worship Center service several weeks ago. In Matthew, we generally saw three different responses to Jesus' ministry. Positive, Jesus is the Messiah. Neutral, is Jesus the Messiah? And negative, Jesus is not the Messiah. Now, speaking of Jesus' ministry, 
I want to go back to a very important passage from chapter 4 that will help us as we continue our study of the Gospels. In Matthew 4, 23, Now Jesus began to go all over Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. This represents the full ministry of Jesus. Teaching, which was to inform and instruct. Preaching, which is to inspire and bring conviction and healing. The mistake is that often we claim Jesus focuses on one as a higher priority than another, but all three are important. However, it is interesting that throughout Christian history, different generations can tend to focus on one in particular, while neglecting or minimizing the importance of the others. We have seen, seen this even in our own churches over the last 40 years. The older generation, particularly, focused on the preaching aspect of ministry, focusing on missions and church growth. Some of the middle generations began to focus more on the teaching ministry, pursuing greater education and focusing on maturing the churches. I especially appreciate the younger generations, as they have focused more on the ministry of Jesus that has often been neglected, the healing ministry. They focus on the health of the church and serving the poor, the sick, and the marginalized. The mistake each generation makes is emphasizing that one is the highest priority of Jesus. If you really want to know what Jesus focused on the majority of his life, it would be simply being a good Jewish son and brother, who most likely supported his family for 15 or more years as a carpenter. If you want to focus on just the ministry of three years, the majority of his time was actually spent teaching and training the Twelve. He spent considerable time alone in prayer. He spent a fair amount of time just traveling by land and sea. And he spent some time teaching the crowds, and he spent a little bit of time in the temple, especially near the end. Along the way, we have many recorded encounters of healing and performing miracles, both in group and individual settings. If we could help bridge the generational gaps in our own churches, together we could fulfill the whole ministry of Jesus. Teaching, preaching, and healing. They are all important. As you continue to read the Gospels, take notice of each of these ministries of Jesus. Matthew, throughout his Gospel, reveals that Jesus had authority in all of them, his words and his works. This leads now to what I would like to discuss today, that I believe that Matthew was really trying to communicate to his readers. In chapters 5 through 7, Matthew focused on his words, in which he concludes that section with this statement in Matthew chapter 7, verse 28 and 29. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, because he was teaching them like one who had authority, and not like their scribes. In the next two chapters, 8 through 9, Matthew focuses on his works. These two chapters really stand together as one unit, revealing the authority of Jesus in his works. Matthew structured the two chapters this way. We begin with three miracle stories, chapters 8, verses 1 through 17, followed by two descriptions of discipleship, chapters 8, verses 18 through 22. And then three more miracle stories in chapter 8, verse 23, through chapter 9, verse 8. And you guessed it, two descriptions of discipleship in chapter 9, verses 9 through 17. And then it concludes with three miracle stories, chapter 9 verse 18 through 34. Why is this important? Matthew is claiming that Jesus possesses absolute authority in the world and warrants absolute allegiance from the world. I could do several sermons from this material, so let's highlight a few while also summarizing the whole. First point, Jesus has authority over disease. In Matthew 8, 1-4, we see that Jesus is willing 
to cleanse a leper. And then in Matthew 8, verse 5 through 13, let's read there. When he entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed in terrible agony. He said to him, am I to come and heal him? Lord, the centurion replied, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. Hearing this, Jesus was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with so great a faith. I tell you that many will come from the east and west to share the banquet with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus told the centurion, Go, as you have believed, let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that very moment. What was so great about the centurion's faith is his belief in the Lord's ability to heal, or even more, his faith in the authority of Jesus to heal. We have no evidence before this in Matthew that Jesus had ever performed a miracle in this manner. This centurion was not leaning on prior information. He simply and humbly had absolute trust in the authority of Jesus in a way that no one else among the Jewish people, including the disciples, had displayed it to this point. It is clear that Jesus has authority over disease. In Matthew 8, verse 14 through 17, we see the continued story as Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law and healed many who were demon-possessed or sick. Matthew quotes Isaiah 53, 4, the famous suffering servant passage, as he concludes this miracle story. We find it in Matthew 8, verses 17. So that what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. He himself took our weaknesses and carried our diseases. This is an interesting use of the Old Testament text in connection with Jesus' authority over disease. As the context of the Isaiah passage actually has another prophetic focus. Let us look actually to Isaiah 53, verse 4 through 6. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses, and he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. Is Matthew connecting sin and disease? It's more likely that Matthew is giving a very subtle reminder of what was the goal of his public ministry and a subtle criticism of those who so focus on Jesus' miracles as to ignore his suffering and death. Following these three miracle stories, Matthew includes two descriptions of discipleship. His authority should be followed by allegiance. Jesus has authority over disciples. In Matthew 8, verse 18 through 20, we read, When Jesus saw a large crowd around him, he gave this order to go to the other side of the sea. A scribe approached him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus told him, Foxes have dens, and birds of the sky have nests but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. If you accept his authority, then you need to learn that Jesus is worthy of unconditional trust. We don't come to Jesus to get blank, health, wealth, etc. We come to Jesus to get Jesus. In other words, if you come to me, I'm all you've got. Let's continue in Matthew 18, verse 21 through 22. Lord, another of his disciples said, first let me go bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me 
and let the dead bury their own dead. Commentators disagree over what is actually being requested here. Does the man just want to give his father, who is deceased, a proper funeral? Or does he want to wait until his father, who is alive, dies and he gets his inheritance before he agrees to follow Jesus? Regardless of the precise meaning, it is clear that Jesus is worthy of undivided affection. Jesus has authority over disaster. Matthew 8, verse 23 through 27. Jesus rebukes the wind and the sea. Disciples respond, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the sea obey him. Jesus has authority over demons. In Matthew 8, verse 28 through 34, Jesus sends demons into pigs. Demons have fear because of their belief, whereas we often have fear because of our unbelief. And then Jesus has authority over sin. We want to read this one, Matthew 9, verse 1 through 8. So he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Just then, some men brought to him a paralytic lying on a stretcher. Seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, Have courage, son. Your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the scribes said to themselves, He's blaspheming! Perceiving their thoughts, Jesus said, Why are you thinking evil things in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, then he told the paralytic, Get up, take your stretcher, and go home. So he got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were awestruck and gave glory to God, who had given such authority to men. Which is greater, healing or forgiveness? What we need most is forgiveness. Healing does not bring salvation. Only forgiveness does. The good news is not about miracles. It is about forgiveness. This miracle was to confirm his authority to forgive sin as the greater priority, not to confirm his authority to only heal. Jesus has authority to save. In Matthew 9, verse 9 through 13, Jesus calls Matthew to follow him. Disciples asked by the Pharisees, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answers, It is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. In the next section, Matthew gives us two miracles in one episode, each again showing his authority. Jesus has authority over despair. Matthew 9, verse 20 through 22. A woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years is healed by her faith. If I can just touch his robe, I'll be made well. Jesus has authority over death. Matthew 9, verse 18 through 19, and verse 23 through 26. Jesus raises a leader's daughter back from the dead. Death does not have the last word. Jesus does. Jesus has authority over disability. Matthew 9, verse 27 to 31. Jesus heals two blind men. Do you believe that I can do this? Matthew concludes with another exorcism story, again showing Jesus' authority over demons. Matthew wants to make clear that Jesus has all authority over disease, disciples, disaster, demons, sin, salvation, despair, death, and disability. This is the purpose of Jesus' ministry, through both his words and works. In Matthew 9, verse 35, we need to read this. Jesus continued going around to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Jesus' ministry was not only to teach, preach, and heal. It was to reveal that Jesus, through both his words and his works, has all authority. In Matthew 9, verse 36 through 38, we read, When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them, because they were distressed 
and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. A short verse, but very powerful. The one with all authority is also the one with compassion. In the very next chapter, this prayer is answered as Jesus commissions the 12 disciples and gives them authority to imitate his own ministry of teaching, preaching, and healing. Jesus has all authority and therefore deserves all allegiance. I don't think anyone would be surprised at how Matthew would like to conclude his gospel. Let's end there in Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Matthew concludes his gospel with a very clear quote of Jesus. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. We need to trust wholeheartedly in Jesus' authority. We need to rest peacefully in Jesus' authority. We need to submit completely to Jesus' authority, and we need to rejoice gladly in Jesus' authority. Jesus has all authority. Authority over disease, disciples, disaster, demons, sin, salvation, despair, death, and disability. His teaching, preaching, and healing confirmed his authority. If we truly embrace his authority, then it should follow with our allegiance and conclude with our action to go and make disciples of all nations. Thanks so much, Derek, for that powerful message. What really stood out to me was the amount of time that Jesus spent in prayer, teaching, and traveling for the gospel. I truly believe that this is what gave Jesus the inspiration and motivation to be able to have authority over sin and demons in the earth realm. Thank you for joining us today. If you would like more information about the DFW Church, you can find us on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook, or log on to our official website at the link below. Before we go, our brother and co-evangelist Todd Asad has a special announcement he would like to share with us. Let's hear from Todd. Brothers and sisters, during the summer, the members of the DFW Church are reading the four gospel accounts of our Lord Jesus Christ together. In the Gospel of John, he makes it pretty clear why he wrote his account. We see in John chapter 20, in verse 30, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. We, as a church, are reading because we believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that by believing we will receive life in His name. John is also clear what it means to believe. It's not just this, intellectual understanding, but it's a life of trust, obedience, and love. We see in John chapter 14, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Chapter 15, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Chapter 17, I do not ask for these only but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. 
The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may be, become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. If we love Jesus, we will keep his commands. And the two of the easiest ways to show that we are his disciples is to love one another and be united with one another. On July 18th, we'll be having our first congregational service at the Irving Convention Center this year. Aaron Salazar will be preaching the message that morning. He leads the El Paso Church. We will also appoint three new elders to help shepherd the church. But we will also introduce a special guest visiting with us. Last year, Pierre Saget and I were discussing how to help the church to address the racial unity in our broken world during the COVID lockdown. As we were sharing articles and things that we were reading and, and other people could read, we came across an article by Dr. George Yancey, who was at one time a professor at UNT in Denton. It turns out he's now down in Baylor as a professor of sociology. I was telling Pierre, we got to meet this guy. Let's have lunch with him because he still lives in Denton. So Pierre and I and a number of other brothers got together and had lunch. We just wanted to pick his brain, see what he thought, give us some ideas that we can lead better. Then we decided to have a second lunch. And we thought, maybe we can bring him in. He's done extensive research and has written several books on communication within interracial groups, which many of us have read since then. We invited Dr. Yancey in January to meet with our Texas family of church leaders. This included the leaders of Chicago, Kansas City, Nashville, to teach and train us. Since then, Dr. Yancey has reached out to us and has invited us, every member of the DFW Church, to participate in a peer-reviewed research project aimed at evaluating and enhancing the effectiveness of collaborative com conversations in multiracial ethnic churches like ours. As disciples, we stand to gain a lot from the insight and training that will be made available to us through this project. To love, to be one with each other, all nations, to be a light to a lost world. Honestly, in my mind, it's all about discipleship. We're going to be able to be trained to love and to be unified with someone not like us. So there are some requirements for this project. Number one, to participate in a two-hour workshop. This workshop will take place immediately after an abbreviated congregational service at the Irving Convention Center on August 29th. Number two, to participate in six small group discussions with six to eight other individuals from the DFW Church. These small groups will be racially diverse, mixed throughout the church, and scheduled to meet for about an hour and 15 minutes outside of church services, either on a weekly, bi-monthly, or monthly basis. The members of each small group will decide whether to meet online, as in Zoom, or to meet in person. Number three, completion of three separate short surveys throughout this process. The surveys will be conducted through email and will take no longer than 20 minutes to complete. Completion of the first survey will be required before the workshop on August 29th. 
The second will be required immediately after the last small group discussion. And the third will be required six months after the last small group discussion. To register for the research project, please use the QR code link displayed on the screen. Brothers and sisters, I believe as an evangelist of the DFW Church, this is an incredible opportunity for discipleship, for all of us to have our hearts discipled so we can love, to be unified with each other, but also to make a difference in a broken and lost world. I love you. Thank you for your willingness to participate. I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, Todd. At this time, we encourage you to join your small groups for a time of communion and fellowship with one another. Until next time, have, have a great, great Sunday. Sunday. Grace runs deep While I was
to Zion from their freedom came a scheme and why God is done. God is done.